Start that. All right. Let's do this thing. Go, Lucas. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Eastside Freedom Library 2020. Um, my name is Lucas Erickson. I have no affiliation with the library, but uh, but they are the presenting host tonight with um, my my uh, sm small little program I started a few years ago called On Stage. Um, it's it's a program that uh, the purpose is really to to make local theater uh, relevant to to younger and non traditional audiences. Um, this is our ninth talk talking about this play, The Resistible Rise of Arturo Uwe. Uh, the previous eight discussions have all been in college classes, um, but, but I also like to keep it open to have some of these discussions and community settings for people that aren't attending school and wanna talk about this. Uh, so yeah, today we, were, we had one talk with uh, creative writing class at Metro State University and an intercultural communications class at Augsburg. Three more tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so I mean, we're here joined by a couple friends that are pretty awesome theater educators around town, Maria Asp and Wendy Knox. Um, and we're here talking about this play that um, you know, was presented at Frank Theater in 2001. I hear that Peter and Beth were part of the production too. More on that later. But uh, obviously there's no plays going on right now, but we thought this was a super relevant uh, piece to talk about with the election two weeks away. So that's why we are here. Uh, a few quick ground rules. Uh, if you have a question, you know, you can type it in the in the discussion or the write it up or just unmute yourself and ask, jump in whenever. Um, turn your, keep your video on if you're able to, if you're not, that's okay. Closed captions are up right now, so you can turn those off if you want. And lastly, uh, we really just want to hear from you. So uh, please ask questions or anything you want. Um, and we're going to look at a couple scenes from this play. I'm going to share my screen a couple of times. Um, we might need a brave reader or two along the way. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's jump in here. I'm going to put up a poll and let me turn it over to our fearless leader, artistic director of Frank Theater, Wendy Knox. Oh, that would be me, fearless. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there are a couple of golden retrievers here in the house so if they happen to start voicing opinions i will try and mute them as soon as i can sorry about that um so yeah as lucas said we uh we staged this play in um 2001 and we opened i think it was the weekend after 9 11 and um <clears throat> i don't know who knows who's familiar with frank theater in this group anybody Anybody know Frank? Okay. Uh, well, we've been around for like 31 years and um, we performed in just about every venue in town. We just do a couple shows a year. Um, uh, Arturo Ui was the first piece that we did in, a, um, after performing in just about every venue in town, we decided who needs a theater. So we started performing in empty buildings. And um, we did this, Arturo Ui was the first one that we did. We did a number of shows at the uh, Sears building before it was developed into the Midtown Global Market. Uh, we did a couple of pieces over at the um, uh, Pillsbury A Mill across the river from the Guthrie uh, and several other venues around town. Most recently, I think was uh, Rainbow Foods here on Lake Street. We did a couple of years ago. So. Um, it was great being able to do this particular play in the, it was a former ammunition plant that we did it in and they were going to tear the building down. It was on the, uh, uh, it was on the Metro State, State um, University property near, near where the library is now. And um, so we could do whatever we want. We could paint on the floor, on the ceilings, and we discovered things in the buildings like, oh, look at that garage door. Can we work that into the set? Or look, there's a, hey. There's a manhole. Um, who wants to go to the manhole? 
clearly Ozzy wants to go in the manhole. So, um, so uh, um, that was, uh, it was great fun. Um, hang on just a second. I just would add that um, the manhole, I just, I, it was a lot of grizzle to get that thing open, but was it ever worth it? <laughs> so, um, um, are people here in the audience familiar with Bertolt Brecht? You guys can't all talk at once. I can't hear you. You can, you can nod or you can go to your reaction button and give us a thumb. We got a couple. We got a couple. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, um, Brecht has sort of been, I think Uwe was the second Brecht piece. We'd done Three Penny Opera in 1999. And then, uh, then this was the second piece that we did. And since then, we've done a number of a number of his works. He's kind of, uh, along with Carol Churchill, it'd be like patron saint of Frank Theater. Um, and uh, one of the things that we like about it is because he, about his writing is that he uh, does not approach theater as something that you could walk in, sit down, get comfortable and just sort of drift off to sleep. That he is, um, intends theater to be sort of a, um, something that should engage you and you should uh it should provoke you to action and um i think when we did this piece P peter you can refresh me too but when we did this piece too it was george bush was running for office correct yes peter? yeah so um and uh one of the things that he so this play is about um brecht had this fascination with um <laughs> kind of all things American, American pop culture, American culture. He loved gangsters. He loved the idea of California. He loved Charlie Chaplin. And so he would take all these things and work them into his plays in whatever way. So in, in this piece, um, it's about Arturo Ui is um, a, a gangster. Um, Brecht was particularly taken with Al Capone. And so um, he, uh, he, um, and the play is about this gangster trying to amass power, rise to power, and it's set in Chicago, which is another city that he was fascinated by. So, um, and he wrote this play shortly after World War II, and in it, he it's written as a parable play, parable play, so it's meant to be uh, to teach a lesson, and it is um, he he kind of does an equation of. Uh, Arturo Uy as a gangster with Adolf Hitler and his rise to power. Um, in the in writing the play, which is structured in a number of scenes, um, he prefaces each scene with a title, um, and the titles form a kind of timeline of historical events that that led up to uh, to Hitler's rise to power. So a contemporary audience watching the play would understand that these dates and that, that, that this is what, you know, and the title, as you note, is The Resistible Rise of Arturo Uy, implying that it could have been, his rise could have been stopped. It could have been if people had made different choices. But um, this timeline sort of shows how he, how he rose to power. And when we did it, uh, our feeling was that a lot of these dates and references would be lost on a contemporary American audience. So we um, enlisted the brain trust of Ratcliffe Cleary to um, help us uh, create a timeline of uh, contemporary uh, to that time events that were that sort of detailed um, the US involvement kind of around the world. Peter, anything else you wanna say about that? Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just annoyed by the headline that it was bogged down by politics. And I, I wondered who was the idiot critic who wrote that. It was that. Graydon Royce. Who else is oh, the my. idiot that would write that? Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was energized by politics. Yeah. I mean, the, to make that critique of a Brecht play, to say it's bogged down by politics is kind of just, I mean, stupid. So, yeah. so. Anyway, but anything you want to say about that timeline, Peter? Do you remember anything about that? Um, 
I don't. Okay, all right, just a sec. Um, I'll, I'll jump in for a second to say ahead. how fun it is. Outside, um, I'm sorry. That all the pictures that Lucas was showing you and just a little something about the process. Um, we, we really miss being in the rehearsal room. We, we miss doing the plays, but one of the things Wendy and I have talked about is how much we miss the table work that Frank does. And um, everybody is going to the libraries and getting pictures of gangsters. And we looked at a lot of political cartoons. So when we do a Frank play, the cast really does a research deep dive uh, which makes it so much fun. And very often rehearsals will start with book reports or show and tells. So, yeah. And, and again, with his work um, in particular, there's, there's so much history to sort of uh, dig through and digest and look at what the parallels are with the contemporary moment. So, um, so, and, and the other thing that's super fun with this play is that there's a very, there was a very uh, broad physical style to it. You know, he, he, he uh, creates his characters not like with a fine point um, pen and ink drawing, but more like with a magic marker. So they're very bold, they're very cartoonish. So the style, it had a very distinctive, um, uh, you know, physicality to it and was great fun to, to work on the piece. So we um, had wanted to, um, to uh, we were hoping to produce the play this fall. We would be doing it right now, hopefully, but, um, Sadly, we can't. So, how, how, Wendy, how would you have? Uh, are there any things that you could just think about? I mean, obviously, you, you didn't even get into the process of doing the play, but if you were to do it now, how would how would it have? Some of it be different than it was. Obviously, we're in a different time period, but um, I, I, I don't know. One thing you could take that timeline, and it could be much more specific to the to. Uh, I, I, I mean, again, because our impetus looking at sort of how we're dancing with fascism right now, um, the idea of we could have much more um, local, I mean, sort of national uh, timelines rather than the, the, the ones we had for Bush were sort of um, international. And it was, kind of, it was great because one night, one of the titles were read and someone in the audience stood up and said, that's bullshit. It was really great. So we kind of pissed someone off with that. But um you know, I just think that uh, the play would have a great resonance right now because we see how someone who is a sort of unlikely kind of schlump rises to this power. And, you know, I mean, I can think of some parallels in our <laughs> current situation. So, um, so I, don't, I mean, that's, that's one thing that just immediately comes to mind. But it felt like it would be very timely to do it right now, you know. Um, and it felt like, again, when we were thinking six months or a year ago about the idea of doing it, it felt like it would be a relief to be working on a play like that, you know? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, should, we, yeah. should we, what do you think, Bria? Should we go around and hear from everybody? Yeah, I, I was just going to add a, cu a couple of other little, um, little anecdotes about the production. And um, certainly Beth and Wendy jump in. But I know that when we started working on it, there were two, two kind of concepts that I know as an as a actor in 2001 really confused me about Brecht. And one is that when you start reading about Brecht, you read, it's like the alienation effect. And I'm like, what is that? What, you know, you spend so much time as an actor trying to engage with the audience. But then um, the Wendy's process, like, You'll probably hear her say tonight, what's up with that? And at, we really figured it out as a group. But like the titles that Wendy was talking about, a lot of the alienation effect is really in the script. And, and it's, it's things that have become normed now, like actors moving scenery or actors waiting on the side, um, waiting to enter or actors playing multiple roles. Like it, there'll be a time where you'll actually see the actor put a coat on and a hat and become a reporter in one scene and then leave that scene, take off those costume pieces and be returned to another character. So those are the stylistic things um, that, that Brecht is hoping that, we, that we're getting you to think about what's happening rather 
than being swept along um, in the narrative. And they're just to give you a, enough distance in the text. The other thing that Wendy was talking about is like in the cartoon style, um, and I'm probably gonna pronounce this wrong, but we talked a lot about like this gestus or this, this German word about your character's attitude. But we would all come up with like three distinctive physical cartoonish um, postures that we would put on as we would embody the character to show what our function was in the play. So most of the characters in the play are not just Uwe mirroring Hitler, but they are also different famous Nazis or members of um, the ruling party during the Weimar Republic. So we, we had both the historic context to draw on, and then as uh, Wendy said, the gangster motif and the political cartoons. And would you like to hear my favorite vegetable? Yeah. I just thought I could tell you were thinking, what is her favorite vegetable? I'm going with cabbage. I'm Maria, she, her, a long uh, time member of the Frank Theater community. Um, cabbage, Lucas. Lucas Erickson, he, him, his. Uh... Today's vegetable of the day is uh, peas. All this is going to go with peas. Mm. Uh, and I am the board chair of Frank Theater, and uh, that's me. Wendy. I am Wendy She, her, and my vegetable du jour would be, um, I think I'm still sticking with avocado. That was the vegetable earlier today, and I'm still sticking with avocado. So. Who's next? Artie! Hello. <laughs> ah, I'm Artie and uh, he, him, I guess. Um, no, I'm sure. <laughs> um, vegetable, which uh, I wasn't prepared for that, but the uh, first one that came, comes to mind is green pepper. Oh, okay. You want to pick someone else in the lineup here? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I, I, Rabia or Rabia is yeah, Rabia. Rabia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, Rabia. She, her, and I am new to theater. And um, my favorite vegetable would be carrots. And then I'm going to pick East Side Freedom. Let, let, me, let me jump in really quick. Ra Ra Rabia, Rabia is also from. Uh, University of St. Thomas, she's studying uh, mechanical engineering. Yeah. And she's, uh, she's, she's volunteering through the Center for Common Good over there. So uh, anyway. Just, so and she had called on Peter. So Eastside Freedom Library, tell us your favorite vegetable. Here we are with bad lighting. <clears throat> oh, I too, double. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so Peter, he, him. Uh, and the Eastside Freedom Library is thrilled to be collaborating with Frank Theater. Um, and uh, I would guess that Maria beat me to cabbage, uh, given the play, but uh, I'll say eggplant. <laughs> oh, I, given the play, I've got to say cauliflower. Yeah. <laughs> but I, and I'm Beth Cleary, she, her. Is there anyone else in this picture that you need to introduce us to? Mary and David Parker. No, I meant in your particular frame. Oh, afraid... you mean a dog who is being yes. very... He's calm. Yeah, okay, all right, all right, okay. <laughs> yes. All right, so who did you call on, Beth? Mary and David Parker. Okay. Ah, there I am. Well, definitely Brussels sprouts, at least today. <laughs> Roasted Brussels sprouts. Yum. You want to call on someone else? Well, who's left there? Janet? I, I, who didn't go? We have Janet and a painting. Ah, who's ever the... Well, I'll go for a painting. Chamas Pereira? Let's go to Janet.
Janet, are you there? Guess not. Well, I think it's back to you, Wendy. And uh, okay. can you tell well, so us might, why? We... Yeah, why do we want to know what your favorite vegetable is? Yeah. Well, one of the things that in the play is that, uh, and Brecht was brilliant in terms of he would do, he, he also had a great sense of humor about stuff. And he would try and set these things in these, I mean, often unlikely locales or sort of things. And one of the things, as Uwe is trying to amass this power it, in Chicago, um, one of the groups that he approaches for support is the uh, the Cauliflower Trust, which is a group of sort of vegetable traders. So the Cauliflower Trust plays um, heavily in, in this play. So um, that's why we asked about the vegetables. So um, should, should, we, should we go right into the first scene here? Or, or Maria, do you want to play a little game? What do you think? Well, I, I think we can go in the first scene, but I, I also want to say like, that that the first time I read it, I called Wendy and I'm like, Wendy, I don't get it. Why are what is the deal with the vegetable trade? But it's also like the giving it the distance. So it isn't a play about Hitler and the rise of the f fascism. It's it's setting it in this context that gives it just that not enough distance or alienation. I think we can go into the first scene. All right, let's do it. Who's reading? Lucas, are you reading? No. Does that mean I I'm Ra reading? I think, I think Rabia is going to read a scene, read one of the characters. Oh, is she? No. Is she? I don't, I don't want to throw her under the bus. All right. Come will on, will you read one of them, Rabia? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay, so do you want to be um, Uwe or Dogsboro? Um, I'll be Dogsboro. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to give you a little bit of context. At the beginning of the play, Uwe was not the, ha had not come to be super confident. In fact, he and his gang of, of gangsters were kind of a mess. He was sitting around kind of complaining that they're not even writing about me in the paper anymore. So he's kind of a mess and he's scrapping around and he's trying to get some power. And, um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit of that transition in our next scene. But um, so we got Dogsboro here and Dogsboro does have status and power and, and represents, you know, he, he's, uh, Rabia, you've got your um, gray wig, right? I, I, I could trade hairs with you, but you're, you're all, you're an old, old man that's been around a long time and has some power and status in the community. And I'm trying to get something from you, okay? I'm going to give you a three, two, one action. Three, two, one action. I'll tell you what you need. The Cauliflower Trust needs muscle. 30 determined men under my leadership. Whether the trust would want to change its typewriters for Tommy guns, I have no way of knowing. You see, I'm not connected with the trust. Oh, we'll get to that. You say, uh, with 30 men armed to the teeth at home on our premises, how do you know that we ourselves are safe? The answer is very simple. He who holds the purse strings holds the power. And it's you who hands out the pay envelopes. How could I turn against you even if I wanted? Even without the high esteem I, I bear for you. For wh what do I amount to? What following have I got? Oh, a handful. And some are dropping out. Right now it's 20 or less. Without your help, I'm finished. It's your duty, your human duty to protect me from my enemies. And I may as well be frank, my followers too. The work of 14 years hangs in the balance. I appeal to you man to man. As man to man, I'll tell you. You, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm calling the police. What? The police? Exactly, the police. Am I to understand that you refuse to help me as a man? 
Well, then I demand, I demand it of you as a criminal, because that's what you are. Mm-hmm. I'm going to expose you. I've got the proof. There's going to be a scandal about some docks, and you're mixed up in it. Sheets, shipyard, that's you. I'm warning you, don't push me too far. They voted to investigate. They never will. They can't. My friends. Ah, you haven't got any. You had some yesterday. Today, you haven't got a single friend. And tomorrow, you'll have nothing but enemies. If anybody can rescue you, it's me, Arturo Ui. Me! Me! Nobody's going to investigate. My hair is white. Yeah, but nothing else is white about you, Dogsboro. Think, man. It's now or never. Let me save you. One word from you and any bastard who touches a hair on ya, your white head, I'll drill him. Oh, Dogsboro, help me now. I beg you. Once, just once, oh, oh, say the word, or I shall never be able to face my boys again. <laughs> never. Oh. I'd sooner die than get mixed up with you. I'm washed up and I know it. Forty and still a nobody. You gotta help me. <laughs> Never. I'm warning you. I'll crush you. Never. Never while I draw breath will you get away with your green goods racket. Mr. Dogsboro, I'm only 40. You're 80. With God's help, I'll outlast you. And one thing I know, I'll break into the green goods business yet. Never. Come on, Roma, let's get out of here. All right, so what do you hear in that scene, you guys? What do you make, what's going on there? I could hear someone else's voice say some of those lines. Who, who was that? Who would that be? Trumpster. The Trumpster. Oh, the yeah. Trumpster. Okay, yeah. Awesome, yeah. Definitely, you can see a parallel of what's going on. Yeah. Uh -huh. what, are, what, are, what, are, what are some of the reasons you hear his voice? What, what, brings, what brings that up to you? So, so he's out to get his enemies. He's out to get his friends. He wants everyone else to get his enemies. He wants everyone else to get his friends. I mean, it's just like, oh dear. Yeah. He's saying, I'm the only one who can save you. Like, it's all me. <laughs> yeah. And we'll use any tactic possible to get what it, what it is he wants. So anything else? So, so this is, happens kind of at the beginning of the play. So this is when Dogsboro is the first person he's trying to shake him down to get his support. And you can see how he goes from sort of wheedling, begging, pleading, threatening, you know. So, um, and that, that's the start of his, of his thing. So do you want to do the next one, um, Lucas, or? Well, so before, yeah. the, there's this great scene um, that, that actually a lot of politicians um, have coaches, but there's this scene where this actor comes in to help groom Uwe's style and practice his gestures and, and to get him to be more confident in the way he walks. So he has all this coaching. And then the other thing that's happening, because I got to play the killer in the play, <laughs> Um, is that there's all this chaos happening. So as, as Uwe is, is shifting to be um, a little more polished in his approach, they're, um, they're killing off people. And they, um, one of the things I loved is that then they're, they're like pretending like they don't know anything about it, but they're like, they, they're wearing the hats of the people that they killed in the next scene. And they'd be like, what, what? I wasn't even in town yesterday and I have 152 people that say I wasn't here but they're posturing um, by wearing the dead man's hat and they're they're causing all this chaos so they're making a lot of distraction 
Maria, I thought you were going to kill me and put the, your white hat on. Oh, yeah. What happened to Lucas? What happened Wait. to Lucas? Yes, you, did yes, you hear she'll that gunfire off stage, Wendy? Yeah, I heard that. Oh, my God. What could have happened to... Where did Lucas? I hope he's okay. I have no idea what happened to Lucas. <laughs> I, was, I was giving my dogs a Kong. They can vouch for me. So <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So, and again, it's okay. interesting because all of the characters that all of the characters that U Ui has as his henchmen have parallels in like Hitler's cabinet. So it's, I mean, again, it's very interesting to, to look at the, uh, the, the, the uh, link between the sort of historical basis he's drawing from and then what the dramatic, the narrative he's setting up. So, all right. Second scene. Artie, will you uh, jump in on this one with us? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Artie's in. Okay. Yeah, Artie's I... in. How, how about Eastside Freedom oh Library? <laughs> Peter, will you be a reader F for us? F is Peter? in. Beth is in? Okay, Beth? that's awesome. And, uh, and how about Mary? Oh. Mary's in. David okay. says my man. In. All right. Okay. So let's set this up a little bit. This is, uh, he's talking to the vegetable traders, right? This is his campaign speech, so to, right. so to speak. Right. And this, it's divided into three chunks, isn't it, Lucas? I mean, there's... Yeah, I, I, it's all one speech, but I... Uh, so the first person can go, uh, Artie will go, and then there's a, I drew a line there. So then the, uh, Peter, you can start after that, and we'll just go back to back. Up Sound speaker, good. So you can just... Okay, so I'm, I'm reading, start off reading, Ui. Yeah, you're all, yeah. Artie, you're all Ui. It's okay. one big giant Ui speech <laughs> that we divided up. Got okay, it. and remember, hey, Artie, you've had coaching, so you are no. slick now. <sighs> yeah, you're coached. You are coached. You are coached. Maria, three, two, one. Oh, yeah. Three. 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 Two, two, one, action. action, murder, extortion, highway robbery, machine guns sputtering on our city streets, people going about their business, law-abiding citizens on their way to City Hall to make a statement, murdered in broad daylight, and what, I ask you, do our town fathers do? Beth, you're up. Nothing. These honorable men are much too busy planning their shady little deals and slandering respectable citizens to think of law enforcement. In short, chaos is rampant because if, any if everybody can do exactly what he pleases, if dog can eat dog without a second thought, I call it chaos. Look. Suppose I'm sitting peacefully in my vegetable store, for instance, or driving my cauliflower truck, and someone comes barging not so peacefully into my store, hands up, or with his gun, punctures my tires. Under such conditions, peace is unthinkable. But once I know the score, once I recognize that men are not innocent lambs, then I've got to find a way to stop these men from smashing up my shop and making me, when it suits them, put them up and keep them up when I could use my hands for better things. For instance, counting pickles. Artie. For, oh, for such as man, he, he'll never put aside his hard work of his own free will, say for love of virtue or to earn the praises of certain silver tongues at City Hall. If I don't shoot, the other fellow will. That's logic. Okay, and maybe now you'll ask, what's to be done? I'll tell you, but first get this straight. What you've been doing so far is disastrous, sitting idly at your counters, hoping that everything will be all right, and meanwhile, disunited, bickering among yourselves, instead of mustering a strong defense force that, could, that would shield you from... Uh, 
that would shield you from the gangsters' depredations. No, I say. Beth. We'll go to Beth here. <laughs> this can't go on. The first thing that's needed is unity. The second is sacrifices. What sacrifices, you may ask? Are we to part with 30 cents on every dollar for mere protection? No, nothing doing. Our money is too precious. If protection were free of charge, then yes, we'd be all for it. Well, my dear vegetable dealers, things are not so simple. Only death is free. Everything else costs money, and that includes protection, peace and quiet. Life is like that, and because it will never be any different, these gentlemen and I, and there are more outside, have resolved to offer you protection. What do you hear in that speech, you guys? Nice job, readers. Yes. <laughs> what do you hear in that thing? Uh. Or in the Frank vernacular, what's in up the, with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's going on in that monologue? Well, he's building up a case for, it's kind of like the all making an offer you can't refuse. Yeah. And it's like, and he is, he is now at a point where he has amassed some things. And so he's also, I mean, there's the great irony of saying, you know, here are these guys with their Tommy guns. It's like, you know, and they're causing all this destruction and murder and stuff like that. If you want protection, we could give it to you, you know, which again, sounds a little bit familiar to some things I'm hearing in the mm. news, you know? Mm. So, um, yeah. yeah. What but, else? But you're going to have to pay for it. There's going to be a <laughs> trade-off. You do for me, I do for right. you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, to me, it's just, just creating, creating that narrative, that false narrative. I mean, I think right after this scene, the vegetable dealers sort of look at each other like, everything's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong. We don't, we don't need anything. And then he lights one of their stores right. on fire. And then right. it's right there. Right. So, and I love, I love how that monologue starts murder, extortion, highway robbery. And it's like, and what are the other, what are the town city people doing? Nothing. Yeah. You need me to protect you. Yeah. Hey, do you, uh, hmm. yeah, yeah, Peter. Mm. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Lucas. Maria, do you think, or Wendy, should we look at the, uh, that, a different translation of that scene or or you, what do you, you think have about that, that? One? yeah sure. i do well, sure yeah okay okay it sort of reminded me a little bit of the allen ginsburg morlock mola huh. familiar with that poem Moloch is a sexless hydrogen the different translations of, of breck's work too are also just really um you know, some of them are so stilted. So, okay, so here we are. Here's the, here's the same thing. And is, who's this by? Is this by, um, do you remember who this is by, Lucas? Maria, do you remember? It was, I think it was in 2016, I believe. Yeah. When it was written. Okay. Here, I can look and see. Translation? Wow. I know that, I know the person that played Jiri came to see Love and Information. I've got that fact, Ed. <laughs> Maria, do you want to read this? I think there's some naughty words. Yep, We're there ready. are. We're ready I, for them. I know it's <laughs> going to be there new are some for you. Words. We can handle it. Okay. But here I am to speak. What do I know? This is a moment of crisis for our city. Look out your windows violence in the streets and we know why it's not a mystery this city's overrun with immigrants they're bringing drugs they're bringing crime they're rapists homicides up 17 percent 
the largest increase in 27 years. Women, children, viciously mowed down. Just yesterday, a man at City Hall goes there to testify on your behalf. They murdered him. Broad daylight, City Hall. And what does law enforcement do about it? I'll tell ya, not a single goddamn thing. A government has only got one job, defending all its citizens. And if you fail at that most basic job, if all you do is wallow in corruption and you stuff taxpayer dollars in your pocket, in my opinion, you're unfit to leave. You're here. Because let me tell you something, folks. If we don't find a way to come together, if everybody's out for number one, because one's divided, because one, one divided by one equals zero, and zero equals chaos in my book. Like, say I'm sitting in my grocery store, along comes an unpleasant kind of person. He barges through the front door, stick him up, or shoots out all the tires on my truck. Do we just let him get away with that? Because don't forget, the world's a dangerous place. And when that day inevitably comes, when they come barging in and say, hands up to you, you say, but sir, I need my hands. I'm using them to fill my pickle jar. You think you're gonna reason with these people? You think these guys will put away their guns because you ask them nicely? Oh, pretty please? Or because they shook some hands at City Hall? It's a dog eat dog and nice guys finish last. So what's the solution? Well, for starters, you can't go on pretending there's no problem and waiting in your shops like sitting ducks. The problem isn't going to go away because you stick your head under the sand. Ooh, we got some waves. We have to bring back, oh, we have to bring back law and order, folks. We got to take the right defensive measures. I'll tell you what we need. We need a wall a human shield to keep the bad ones out till we can figure out what's going on. And I'm the only one that can provide it because no one knows the system better than me. To do it, though, I'm gonna need two things, solidarity and sacrifice. But you say, Mr. Uwe, sacrifice? How much you think the sacrifice will cost? You're talking 20, 25%. We can't pay that, we're barely, we're barely scraping by. But everything's got a price, you know? Sometimes you gotta stop and ask yourself, how much you wanna pay for peace of mind? So I have brought some specialists along. These gentlemen here are experts in their field. They'll fill you in on the particulars. And All just right, good job. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Well, no, yeah, that's the end. That's the end. Yeah. So that translation is by Bruce Norris, Peter, your favorite oh. playwright, who wrote Clyde Bourne Peter. Park. Yeah. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but um, any comments about those two different versions of the same speech? I really appreciate that you that you did come up with the two. Fascinating to hear, see, read, and hear the. The differences. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're pretty similar. Think, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the same narrative completely, except one takes the current events of 2016 and plugs them in, and they fit perfectly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a wall. Well, perfectly. We need a wall. <laughs> yeah. Not so subtle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Although it's also uh, a speech yeah. that's not only bombast, like the new version, whatever we may think about that playwright adapter, 
um, really reveals the way that like the speaker's thoughts last for about two seconds and then he's on to some other topic which as we know mm -hmm. are the demagogue in chief is really good at and mm -hmm. so in terms of like the the performance i mean you know we see um snippets i'm sure none of us watch his entire speeches by this the current demagogue in chief and sometimes he just leans on his podium and acts like he's gossiping at a barbecue and so like the yeah. levels, like you don't, you never know where you are. And, the, and then suddenly there'll be this explosion of, um, you know, sort of violence out of him. So it's, I mean, it's actually a really fun speech to play in either yeah. translation, but this new one really reminds us of how like thought lasts for two seconds and then goes somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, should we show the, the epilogue at the end? I, I have the translation of that one too. That, that's yeah, pretty, sure. pretty great. So, so as Wendy was saying, like the play starts with an actor coming out and basically telling you everything that's gonna happen, who's in it and what, what their function is. And then at the end of the play, you've watched this gangster rise in power and then and you hear this little ending and Lucas is gonna pull that up. I'll, re I'll read this. Yeah, oh, cool. Therefore, learn how to see and not to gape, to act instead of talking all day long. The world was almost won by such an ape. The nations put him where his kind belong. But don't rejoice too soon at your escape. The womb he crawled from still is going strong. Any comments on the epilogue? Chilling. <laughs> it's awesome. like... And there's, there's. And this there's is usually a... read by Uwe, would you say, Wendy, at the end? I, I missed that. Um, I don't know. I think we did have we read it. I don't know if it usually is or not, but we had there's another version that we had and the again the 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 final line of this other version is often um linked to this play where it says something about um you know it's essentially the same the same thing, you know, don't get too comfortable and it says that uh, you know, but the 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 last line is the bitch who bore him is in heat again, you know, mm -hmm. which is that, and that, I think that's we use that in our production and, and it's referenced a lot too. It's just so any any comments about that epilogue? Well, I, I think it's important as focused as we are on the guy that Beth calls the demagogue in chief. Right. That um, we created him. Yes. Our culture, our country, our history created him. And there's no reason to believe we can't create another one, even if we get rid of him. So and, it, and or mm -hmm. yeah, if if and or even if we get rid of him, that there is it's the other people that have been cultivated that have allowed him that have encouraged him that there could be another one right down the pike, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, so and again, there's. Go ahead, Artie. Do you have something? No, I'm just agreeing with it's. Uh, okay. It's more than than just about an individual. It's about the the system and the uh, this sort of an intransigence of of uh, dysfunction and corruption that's built into the system. Right, and again with his warning that he says, "Don't just sit and you know." He's encouraging the audience to action. You know, it's like you can sit and sort of like all the Facebook things you want to like, but what are you going to get out and do something to make something happen, you know? So that's interesting, I think. Wendy, do you want to read the, the translation? Which one? Of the epilogue. I, ha I have it right here. Oh, this you have it? This will be our last one, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty intense. Oh, intense. Oh, God. Okay, I got to get intense just a minute. <sighs> okay. Uh, can okay. you can you scroll up a little bit with that? Uh, I think it starts right here. Okay, 
The moral of the story, so to speak, is sometimes you can't turn the other cheek. We faced a fucker once like this before. We came together, together, fought a bloody war. And yes, that time we won. But who can say what we might do if he came back here today? Or could it be that he's already here? 2016, what a shitty year. We vote them into power, then we wonder how we made such a catastrophic blunder. It looks as if we're fighting once again, so fingers crossed and hopefully we'll win. But even if we do, one thing's for certain, there'll always be another. Is that the end? I can't see it. Yep, mm -hmm. lights out. Okay, all right. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so there, there we go. So it's a great uh, parable there. It's a great little warning lesson. <laughs> so. Any, any other comments about, about any of this or, or, or the, the production from 2001? Beth, you were the dramaturg on the show? Yes. Yeah, um, I mean, I remember that there was this kind of community response besides the critic that you put up before who was <laughs> negative, but the community response was incredible. I mean, there were like these candlelight um, rituals on the sidewalk outside of the old munitions factory at Metro State where Wendy staged this on the east side of St. Paul. Um, and it was packed. I remember, and I guess we couldn't, you couldn't extend, but there would have been audiences for so long. People were hungry for seeing a representation of the kind of chaos and fear that, you know, was um, everywhere and not being handled well because of, you know, the guy reading my pet goat and saying, go shopping, you know, um, which is a reference <laughs> to Bush. <laughs> But, um, you know, I mean, the, the need for theater like this in that moment was just enormous. And here it is again. I wish, I, I mean, this play would be awesome to do right now. It would be so much. Yeah. 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 I, I want to say that, um, and not just because I really dislike the guy that wrote Clyburn Park, but... I think it works better at a more distanced level. It's where it's not as literal and the audience is being pushed to use our imaginations to think about mm -hmm. the connections between what we're seeing on stage and what we're experiencing rather uh -huh. than being spoon fed by, by a writer. Um, uh -huh. So, I'll take the opportunity to criticize Norris, but but I do think that that it works better when it's when when we have when the audience has to work more. Uh -huh. Well, it's also more universal in that way. It makes again underscoring that point. You know, we're we're in you know a deep well now with this you know situation, but it's not just the now situation. It's mm -hmm. something. You know, yeah. beyond that, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in, in another 20 years, 40 years, which version do you think will, will be more performed? Mm. Given the future distance, the distance that, we'll, that yeah. future generations yeah. will have. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. we won't need to look at this. Hopefully we won't need, that's right. 100 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that's not what the epilogue tells us. I know. <laughs> well, it doesn't say how long. It doesn't say how long it's going to happen. It could be a long time. <laughs> well, well, and the epilogue says, like, pay attention, you know? So it's like, if you don't want to hear this again in 40 years, you know, it's like, it's on, it puts the responsibility on us for action, you know? So. Um, just couple final questions just going to throw at you there and uh and then i guess the last thing is we're uh thank you for joining us today i really appreciate it um obviously we keep, this play is not on stage right now but uh if you would like to to learn more about frank go to franktheater.org um 
Uh, Wendy, or do you yep. have uh, to talk about the Frankly Speaking series? Yeah, I was going to say we, um, you know, because we can't be on stage, and as Maria mentioned, we do miss the sort of intellectual workout of a Frank rehearsal process. Uh, we are trying, and I'm, I don't feel the need to rush to let's do a Zoom reading of a play. I mean, I just, I just don't feel that need. But we have been trying to find ways that we can, how can Frank continue to be active and present? And so um, we uh, started a series of monthly discussions called Frankly Speaking. And we did our, we've had, we've aired two of them. They're presented as Facebook uh, live events, and they're also on our website. And we were using these discussions to sort of um, as as ways of exploring ideas or issues that we might normally be chewing on in a rehearsal process. So our first um, our first discussion was was um, about whiteness in um, Twin Cities Theater. And so we had three artistic directors, three white artistic directors talking just about whiteness and how we you know deal with that. Um, our second one, which was a couple weeks ago, was um, with three black actors uh, uh, addressing the, the value of working on a, a historical piece that somehow has parallels with the contemporary moment. And this happened to be three actors who were in our last show, which was The Convert, set in Zimbabwe in 1896, uh, colonial Zimbabwe. And so um, asking them to sort of respond to um, what does the approaching a play like that and how do you, what does that bring to your work as an artist today um and our next one will be airing probably it's just usually the first wednesday of of the month but given that the first wednesday is going to be the day after election uh day we're trying to move it to the next week so it'll be the following wednesday and that will be um uh uh, the question of white audiences and what happens for how is it for BIPOC artists who are creating who are performing work that's um, comes out of a certain community and um, you know most Twin Cities audiences even in the large theaters or even theaters that are led by um, artists of color are usually uh, white audiences so how does that affect what they do and having them respond to that so they're you know, they just, they air on Facebook. You can look at the previous two ones that are hosted on our website and on on, um, on our Facebook page, but um, that'll be coming up. And so there's that. And then also what Lucas just put up is an offer for $10 tickets for if and when we do get a chance to do Arturo Ui, if you want to come and join us, you can sign up on our Frank um, mailing list and we can keep you posted, so. Please don't say if, just say when. <laughs> when, okay. When. Right, when. Yes. <laughs> So, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us, you guys. Thank you, oh, Peter, oh, and thank you, Lucas. Thanks a lot. Thank, yeah. you. thank you very much. Such a fun thank play to talk all. about. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Okay. See you tomorrow, team. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.